in the next eight minutes of this talk, 20 people will have died and 700 people, 750 people injured on roads worldwide. And the problem is that this is becoming worse. This is ironic because there's so much technology, vehicles are becoming more intelligent, our roadways are arguably becoming a little more intelligent, and yet you see this rise in road fatalities and injuries. And this is a, a truly worldwide problem. In fact, it's become worse since the pandemic. Over the last two years, since 2019, we're seeing a 21% increase in fatalities per 100 miles driven in the United States. So this is not a problem that's actually getting better, it's actually getting worse. So there's a number of different reasons for it. And I'm going to talk to you about what is happening and what can we do about it. If you look at driving risk, there's really three components to driving risk. The first is the risk of the driver themselves behavior of drivers on their roads. And this is something that over the last 10 years, we've got a really good handle on understanding. And a lot of this is due to the pioneering work that we did at MIT starting from 2004 to 2010 as part of the cartel project that I ran uh, with Sam Madden, my colleague, and, and several of our students. About a decade ago, uh, we and others in the industry started commercializing these technologies um, using sensors on smartphones as well as small IoT devices like this and deploying this in the field primarily with auto insurers and then increasingly with automakers, with rideshare companies, with gig companies, and so on and so forth, as well as with, um, with, with city governments. And we today have a pretty good understanding of driver risk, 17% uh, of US uh, auto consu uh, insurance consumers today use these telematics programs to become better. Vehicle manufacturers understand vehicle risk. The problem is not really the vehicle. Vehicles have a tremendous amount of intelligence. The problem is the interaction of humans with those vehicles and the interaction of those vehicles with all of the stuff around us on our roads. So today I'm going to talk about something that has not been looked at in the same amount of detail, which is road risk. Imagine you put the world's safest driver and the world's best driver and the world's best, best vehicle on our roads. There's an inherent level of extrinsic risk caused by other vehicles, caused by the nature of the road geometry and topology. Think Starter Drive, for example, and somebody driving on Starter Drive. It's not the easiest thing. It requires a lot of cognitive uh, concentration. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So our goal in this research is to take the world, the 64 million kilometers of roads uh, in the world, 6.8 million of them in the US, 6.3 million in India, all over the world, and take five meter by five meter, for Americans that's about 15 or 16 feet, five meter resolution, and map the rate at which crashes are likely to happen in the future on those roads. So that's the goal of the project. So in this picture here, the warmer the color, the higher the crash rate. And what we'd like to come out with is to say that given any little part of the road, What's the expected number of crashes per unit time? For example, 11 crashes per year. So that's the problem. Now, why does high resolution matter? Well, if you take a lower resolution, like you say, you divide the world into one kilometer by one kilometer grids, or 250 meters by 250 meters, you end up with a situation as shown in this picture. You might have highways, you might have frontage roads, you might have home, you know, residential roads, and all of that gets accumulated together, and it does not capture the true risk. So you need really fine resolution in order to understand what's happening. The prior work on this field has largely done what you would think of as the obvious thing. Imagine you had a database of prior crashes, and you take those crashes, and then you assume that crashes in the, are, in the future are going to be somewhat dependent on what happened in the past, and do some sort of kernel des density estimation or some model around that. And as shown in this picture here, you take data, in this case, a portion of Los Angeles in 2017 and 2018, and you're trying to predict crashes in 2019 and 2020, and you find that there's a whole bunch of places where lightning doesn't strike twice. Indeed, only about 20% of severe crashes happen at the same, same place. So what are we actually going to do about it? The problem is that crashes are sparse. It's not a problem for the real world. The problem for us as researchers is crashes are sparse. And what that means is obtaining target crash rates is incredibly difficult. If the crash rate in a portion of the world is only 0.1 per year, that's a good thing for society, but it's, you, know, you can't really build models with it. So how are we going to tackle this problem? The answer is we're going to actually understand 
from denser data something about what leads to those crashes. So you could take things like the road geometry and satellite or aerial imagery, which is now available across the world at massive scale, uh, information about traffic volumes, some information about historic crashes, though I will note that even insurance companies don't really know the precise location of crashes because often they ask the driver and like, whatever, the driver doesn't know what, exactly where it happened, uh, they don't even know what speed they're driving at and so on. And you could take driver behavior with telematics that we've now deployed at scale. We have about 25 million users measured over the last three years. And you can put all of that together to start to build an understanding of what's happening. So for example, if, you, if your model learns that crashes happen when the road geometry is a particular way, for example, certain types of exit off-ramp designs or certain types of ways in which roads feed into each other, you can have that model learn that. And that's what we did in a research project starting about four years ago, uh, and this was published two years ago at ICCV. Uh, Song Tao He, shown here, getting his degree. I think he's not really smiling or laughing because he loved MIT so much he didn't really want to leave, but he was the lead uh, on this work. We built a model with a residual network and trained it, and then used it to predict crashes in the future as well as spatially. You train on a certain portion or certain cities, and you can predict crashes accurately in other cities. And when you do this, you end up with some really nice data and, and inferences that you can validate against future crashes. Um, you can predict, for example, that in Manhattan, all of the crashes actually happen at intersections. But you can predict which intersections and exactly what the rate is going to be. You can use this in a variety of different cities, no matter how the design. Because what the model has done is to learn from driving behavior the types of driving and the types of uh, roadway design that actually lead to these crashes happening. It learns, for example, where people are most widely distracted. In Boston, it turns out to be on the Longfellow Bridge. And it actually learns to elevate the predicted crash rates for places like that. And the Longfellow Bridge is not surprising. You try, you're somewhat new to the area, or even if you've been here 25 years like I have, you're never quite sure what lane to be in. And so this is the type of thing that we have to improve. That's what leads to crashes. So what can you use this for? Well, you could use this to improve road infrastructure, which I think is one of the most important things. You want to have evidence-based planning. A few years ago, we did a, a project with the city of Boston called Boston Safest Drivers. And we used this with 50,000 drivers to collect uh, voluntarily a lot of data and rewarded drivers at the end of the contest. And we were able to take anonymous aggregated data and help the city change the locations of a couple of the bus stops that were leading to adverse driving behavior. And so that's the type of thing. Now imagine doing that at scale across the whole country and perhaps across the whole world. You can also do what if experiments. You can test changes in advance and then make predictions about whether those changes are actually going to bear fruit or not with respect to safety. Of course, you can use it for safe routing. You can use it to route vehicles using a road risk score um, in order to be able to drive the, the crash rates down. And you can now personalize this to whether you're familiar with those roads or not familiar with those roads. It turns out actually a greater degree of familiarity, sometimes it actually makes it worse because of complacency. So you can bring all of these things together to provide better safe routing infrastructure as well. The last thing I want to end on is this is not just about keeping people in the vehicle safe. 50% of fatalities and crashes in, on the, in the world today happen to people outside of the vehicle, pedestrians and bicyclists. And in fact, pedestrian, there was just an article this morning about how pedestrian deaths in the US over the last 10 years have risen 77%. It's, it's, it's a big, big problem here. A lot of it is caused by, I think, people on smartphones, weapons of mass distraction. So the project we're working on now, um, led by Arjun, my graduate student, is to build a device that can actually be attached to vehicles uh, using LIDAR that will, in real time, be able to measure the volume of the vehicle, the mass of the vehicle, the proximity of vehicles, and the speed of vehicles nearby so that it can provide advanced warning in cities to bicyclists. And over time, I think that the day is not far off when we can all be wearing jackets or clothing, which will have sensors embedded to keep us safe on the roads. And today, one of the things that's happening with this connected vehicle revolution is that it's only about cars. Vulnerable road users, pedestrians, bicyclists, micromobility are being left out of it. But I think that technologies are now close to being available at scale that can provide safe roads, not only for vehicles, which is important, but for every one of us. Thank you.